completely awake during hypnosis. Contrary to the popular belief that hypnosis is a natural state of mind, it's not a form of sleep. And also you'll be able to hear, comprehend and later remember unless it is helpful to have a suggestion to forget certain aspects. And you know the average person experiences hypnosis at least twice a day. And common examples include arriving at your destination without memory of driving there, and then zoning out while reading a page of a book or becoming so engrossed in the TV that the time just evaporates. Of course, I'm not a hypnosis expert, but I'm presenting you a hypnotist, speaker and filmmaker, John Moyer. So in today's episode, let's talk with John and understand more about hypnosis and also about discovering life purpose. This is the Guiding Voice podcast series, the Guiding Voice for a Better Future. Friends, I'm your host Navin Samala, just a fellow IT professional on a mission to shape the careers and lives of millions across the globe. And through the Guiding Voice, we help and enable successful leaders share their knowledge and wisdom with the world so that our audience will acquire more knowledge by tuning into the Guiding Voice per every minute than any other podcast in this space. Thank you so much for joining me today. And we are extremely pleased and honored to have John part of the Guiding Voice journey in shaping the careers and lives of millions across the globe. John, I'm super excited to have you here, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, and and I loved your uh, your little rundown there of some of the elements of of hypnosis because that is a lot of things that I address with people because there are a lot of misconceptions about yeah. hypnosis. Thank you for your comments, and uh, let's get started, John. Maybe you can briefly share your professional background, like filmmaker, hypnotist, as well as author. And speaker. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I well, yeah, you know, I, I got my degree in theater and film and I graduated with a screenwriting emphasis. So I always, e- even when I was a little kid, I had a passion for being creative in the entertainment industry. While I was in college, I discovered stand up comedy. Uh, there was a comedy club uh, in the, where I went to college. And after I graduated college, I was doing stand up comedy professionally. And then, of course, to me, that was all part of the entertainment industry. And I was, I continued to write scripts. I had some independent films produced. Um, but along the way, I, I always had a fascination with the mind. And after about 20 years of doing stand up comedy, I discovered stage hypnosis. And I went from doing stand up comedy to doing stage hypnosis. And that's when my performances really took off. I got to. Uh, perform all around the world for Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, doing my hypnosis show there. And then, of course, obviously throughout the United States, doing a lot of corporate university events. And But in the, uh, along while all that was happening, I started a YouTube channel doing hypnosis and meditation content because that seemed kind of where it, it all fit together. My, my writing experience, my film and video production experience, and then, of course, my, my passion for what I discovered with hypnosis and meditation. So my YouTube channel took off and that's where I focus all of my, uh, most of my energy now is creating my content on YouTube. I saw that uh, you have crossed 100k subscribers and congratulations on that uh, huge milestone. Thank you. Yeah, it's about 260, I think it's over 260,000 now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So moving on, what, what were the top three things that, have, that you have learned so far and that helped you in your professional careers? I think the, one of the things that I learned early on was that if you believe in yourself, you can go forward and you can accomplish great things. And that, of course, that ties into, you know, that ties into the mind and, you know, believing in yourself and then actually programming your mind for success and just continuing to do that with that, with that passion. A person's career, a person's life, everything that they want to accomplish well, it, it either soars or it sinks, and it's all up to the person. It's all up to what you know, the individual believes. So I'm a, a big proponent of making sure that you want something, you prefer something enough, that you just you have that passion and drive, and then you give, yourselves, give yourself the tools, the mental tools, the emotional tools to be able to, to, be able to achieve that. All right. I think you started as a stand-up comedian and then got into this uh, hypnosis. So that, what fascinated you to get into this uh, hypnosis? Well, yeah, that's it, there was kind of uh, uh, there was kind of two parts to that. I, I mean, I was always fascinated by the mind, but after twenty years of stand-up comedy, 
I started, you know, about 1993, 94. But in the United States, the business of stand-up comedy had changed quite a bit, starting in the early 2000s. Social media had a big impact on that because what was happening was a lot of the comedy clubs weren't necessarily booking the funniest comedians. They were booking the people that had the largest social media followings because they knew that they could get people um, you know, into the clubs. And, and as that kind of began to happen, there were also a lot of, we had a lot of clubs in the United States. They might be open Tuesday night through Sunday or Wednesday through Saturday. A lot of those began to um, kind of shrink up and go away. And a lot of stand-up comedy became, you know, maybe it was a, uh, a Friday and a Saturday night um, at a bar or at a restaurant. So I was getting kind of tired of that and frustrated with that. What I, I was actually performing at an event. Um, it was an all-day event, and I performed my, my stand-up comedy show, and it, and it went well enough. But after me, there was a stage hypnotist, and I stuck around, and I watched the stage hypnotist. And for you know, where I was at in the venue, there was maybe, it was maybe three, half to three-quarters full. And when the stage hyp- hypnotist did his show, it was standing room only. And the audience was engaged. They were laughing. They were having a good time. The participants on stage were great. Uh, and then, of course, after his show, he was selling uh, merchandise. He was selling CDs of uh, stop smoking and weight loss and reduce stress. And I looked at that and I said, man, I, I can do that. You know, I-, I have the ability to be on stage. I know how to connect with an audience. I just needed to figure out how to hypnotize people. But from that, I went and I trained uh, doing stage hypnosis. And then what I was able to do is I went back to all my contacts in the entertainment industry, the people that were booking events or booking venues, uh, managers, agents, those sorts of people. And I said, hey, I've got a whole new show now. I'm doing stage hypnosis. So I was able to really hit the ground running quite quickly. And as I did, it ju- it just took off. And in ways that I could have never imagined. I was able to just skyrocket and I had a whole new audience as well for doing stage hypnosis because I was able to perform in high schools and colleges and, you know, high-end corporate events that were, and then of course, Royal Caribbean Cruise Line doing my show there. So that's kind of how it, it, it happened. And initially it started just because I wanted to be able to do something different and interesting and profitable but then at the same time, it also, I realized how impactful it could be for me personally, as far as, you know, me taking on doing self-hypnosis and meditation for myself. And that also changed my personal life as well, not just my professional life. So that brings me to my next question. Like, how does this uh, hypnosis really work to change people's thinking and behavior? The way it works, and, and it's actually a little easier, I think, than it sounds. but we have two parts of our mind. We have our conscious mind and our subconscious mind. And the conscious mind is where it's exactly what it is. It's we're conscious. We observe things where the subconscious mind takes all of the information that we're seeing and experiencing and hearing it, and it connects it to ways that we've categorized it. So we all have things that we, you know, we know you don't touch a hot stove. And that's something in the subconscious mind that tells us hot is bad. You don't want to touch it. But then all of us have things that are uniquely connected in our subconscious mind that make us, that that gives us whatever patterns of behavior we personally take upon it. You know, some people love to go to the gym and work out. They're, you know, they're, they're very uh, passionate about their, their physical health and other people hate going to the gym. They, they don't want to eat right. And, and it's because of things that we have linked up in our, in our subconscious mind. And so what happens is hypnosis is actually getting into the subconscious mind where the, the operating system uh, or basically our software is and is able to rewrite the programming and rewrite uh, the software that we have in our, in our mind. And it's, you know, it's like they say it takes 21 days to make a habit, form a habit. That's because if you do something over and over and over again consistently, the subconscious mind picks it up and it becomes part of us. It becomes a learned behavior. Hypnosis is able to make that happen a little bit more quickly. It's able to 
disconnect the connections of whatever patterns of behavior we want to get rid of and then reconnects um, or makes new connections. So we now have, have new patterns of behavior. And the way that hypnosis actually works structurally is between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, there is kind of a firewall, kind of a gate, if you will. It's called the critical faculty. And the, the analogy that I use is it's like, at least here uh, you, you know, in the United States, if you have a nightclub, there's a bouncer, a body, you know, kind of a guard outside of the nightclub, and there's a red velvet rope. And he opens up the red velvet rope and lets in the people that he wants to let in or closes the red velvet rope and says, no, you, you know, you're not getting in. So hypnosis kind of distracts that bouncer with the red velvet rope. It's a way of distracting uh, that critical faculty. So when the critical faculty isn't paying attention and distracted, you can then sneak in suggestions to the, to the subconscious mind or input suggestions, not necessarily trying to be sneaky, but you're able to distract one part of the mind so you can quickly access another part of the mind. That's a great analogy. I love the example. And uh, you also mentioned about this uh, self-hypnosis. Does uh, self-hypnosis really work? Yeah, because the, th the thing is, is hypnosis and meditation are, are sister states of mind. They're, you've got the same things that are happening. So if you're doing self-hypnosis, you know, what is self-hypnosis? That's that could simply be listening to an audio program or like listening to a guided meditation. So you don't physically have to have be in the same room, you know, with a hypnotist to be able to make it work. There's like my content on YouTube. Um, if some somebody is simply follows along, they're able to, you know, get into that that state as well. But with me, because I practice meditation on a regular basis. Um, I am able to just sit down and as soon as my body gets in to the position, it knows this is a time for self-hypnosis or meditation and I'm able to access that state quite easily. All right. So moving on and switching gears, let's now talk about the power of mind, right? Uh, everybody is blessed with the same state, but uh, not many people are aware of it, right? Why is that so? Well, you know, the thing is, is that, yeah, we all, we all go through hypnosis every, every single day. It's like you said, it's like, you know, the driving or reading a book or watching television, even looking at a cell phone, people become hypnotized looking at, at you know, at their cell phone. And so it's, a, it's what it is, is you, you're just getting to, you're so focused on one thing that you are oblivious to everything else around you. And I, I loved what you said uh, at, the, at the top of the podcast, talking about uh, you're not really asleep. People think you're asleep. And the interesting history to the, the word hypnosis was hypnosis comes from the Greek word, which means to sleep, because that's what they thought was happening with people. There was a Scottish surgeon, I think, back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. His name was James Braid. As he studied it, he realized that you, people aren't asleep. You're actually in a heightened state of awareness. He wanted to change the name of hypnosis to mono ideaism because you were focusing on, on one idea, but hypnosis stuck. And that's why we still call it, even though it's not referred to uh, refer to that. Um, it's referring to something that's not really, really happening, but you are, you're, you're alert and you're aware you're focused on that one thing. And that's the state that you know, you're in and everybody experiences that. Now, the difference is when I would do, let's say a stage hypnosis show, I might bring 20 people on stage and maybe I remove five or six people because they, they didn't experience the, you know, the hypnosis. And you look for those people that are, are deeply hypnotized and people will say, well, why didn't, why didn't it work for me? And I, I say, I honestly, I don't know. There was something about this experience or you in this moment that didn't work for you at this time. It doesn't mean that it couldn't work for you. And it, it's like, it, it is a learned behavior. It's something that people can learn. It's like when you go to the gym, you're working your muscles, you're building your muscles up and making them stronger. There was a time when I never thought I could be hypnotized um, intentionally, not necessarily in circumstances of reading a book or watching a movie. But when I practiced it, and it happened on me, I was like, wow, this works. So we all have the ability 
Some of us, the ability happens a little easier and naturally. And other people, if they're open to it and if they practice it and make an effort to it, they can develop that um, that ability. So we all have the ability. It's just whether or not somebody, you know, is, chooses to say, "I want to develop this and experience this." And I've seen a couple of videos on this uh, sleeping well by clearing this mental energy and all. So can you share briefly about that? How to sleep well by clearing negative energies? Well, what I do with my my uh, content on YouTube, one of the things, of course, about experiencing hypnosis is it allows you to sleep very, very well. And you're actually passing through a state of hypnosis when you're falling asleep on your own anyway. It just so happens that if you trigger that state intentionally, it, it, it makes it easier. But my YouTube channel initially took off because there were some programs to help people fall asleep. And that resonated with people. Of course, I wanted to be able to have the opportunity to uh, explore other topics. Now, the interesting thing is to the like clearing negative energy is, is, is one of my, one of my big programs. The thing about the mind is when you experience hypnosis is the mind can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not under hypnosis. So if you're experiencing hypnosis and you're being offered positive suggestions that could help you in your everyday life, while you're having that experience, your mind is going to accept those suggestions as real. So the content that I put out um, are topics that can help people in their everyday life. And the example of clearing negative energy. Well, what might be clearing negative energy for somebody? They could feel stressed about their job or stressed about school, or there's people that they interact with that you know may uh, make them anxious or cause stress. It's it's really an everyday you know situation. M- most people might not refer to it as as negative energy, but it's just the stress we deal with every day. So in my programs taking people into hypnosis, I'm creating this experience in their mind. Um, Let's say it's a a visualization that they're able to see themselves being shielded from negative energy. They can have this experience where their mind says, oh, we feel this positive energy shield around us and it's protecting us from the negative people or the stressful situations. So we're not feeling what we would consider to be negative energy. Well, is there really an energetic shield around somebody if the mind believes so, the subconscious mind is going to adapt those qualities for the individual that helps them deal with you know negative people or negative situations where they don't feel stressed or they now feel more empowered, they feel stronger, uh, they feel more capable of being able to handle these situations because their subconscious mind has said, hey, we've got a we've got a protector around us, you know, we can block negative energy. And what's really happening is, is that the subconscious mind is just taking on patterns of thought and patterns of behavior, patterns of action that um, allow the person to be more enabled and more capable and more empowered. Sounds interesting. And moving to the next question, what kind of uh, techniques do you use for this hypnosis? There's a variety of different tools and techniques people use for hypnosis. There's not necessarily um, one thing. But it all evolves around being able to relax somebody, quiet their conscious mind, and essentially distract that critical faculty so you can have access to the the subconscious mind. Um, There's a couple of techniques. One of them is called uh, leading and pacing, where if you're saying to the individual, you would make, let's say, three statements that the person knows to be true. You're sitting there in your chair. Your eyes are closed. Uh, you're hearing my voice. So the the, the, the the mind is going, okay, yes, it's I'm sitting in a chair. Yes, my eyes are closed. Yes, I'm hearing your voice. And then the fourth statement you would make would be the like a hypnotic suggestion. So as you're sitting there in the chair and your eyes are closed and you're hearing my voice and you're beginning to relax completely and experience hypnosis. So it's like, you tell them three things that they know are true. And then the, the fourth statement would be a hypnotic suggestion. That's a way of being able to get into the mind. Another technique that I like to do is called a confusion technique, where you might be saying things that the conscious mind starts to try to figure out. It gets a little bit overloaded. It can't 
you know, it's getting confused. And as the conscious mind is getting confused, you would make a hypnotic statement or a hypnotic suggestion um, because the conscious mind's distracted trying to figure this out over here. And then you say something, uh, a suggestion that you can get into the, into the subconscious mind. So those are a couple of the ways, just part of the tools that somebody might use relative to um, hypnosis. And it's just a matter of when, if I were working with somebody one-on-one, getting to know them a bit before and understanding what the best approach might be with them, how to best relate to them, whether I need to take a more um, paternal approach, you know, a little bit more like a father, you're telling somebody, you know, do this, do this, do this, or does somebody need to be more gently like a maternal approach? You're, you're giving them a little bit, a softer approach. So it's a lot of it's dependent on the individual that you're working with. Of course, when I was doing a stage show and I had 20 people on stage and I had about five to seven minutes to hypnotize them, I had to take a much broader approach and then just kind of see what happens with everybody on stage. You also mentioned about it helps us in dealing with anxiety, right? So what will be Mm -hmm. certain tips to deal with the anxiety? You know what? People feel anxious or they get stressed out because of situations in their, in, you know, in their environment. So when they go into, let's say if somebody goes into school, somebody might get stressed taking tests. Now, why might they get take, why might they get stressed taking tests? It, you know, it could be a case where when they were younger, they took a test, they felt good about it, but maybe they did poorly. And then maybe their parents were upset at them for doing bad on a test. So now that they start to link up all of this within their subconscious mind that, oh my gosh, taking tests. I never do well on tests. My parents get upset at me. My teacher gets upset at me and it creates a lot of anxiety for them. So in that case, what you can do with hypnosis is you can help people to neutralize those negative associations. And as they, as they neutralize those negative uh, associations, you can also give them some empowering tools that help them to feel confident. So in a hypnotic state, maybe you take somebody down to where they're, they see themselves taking a test in their mind. And of course the mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's not. So that would be a very real experience for the subconscious mind. But in that hypnotic state, the person feels relaxed. They feel calm. They feel they're feeling empowered. And now all of a sudden the associations are getting reconnected. So when they're taking the test, the subconscious mind goes, hey, the last time we did this, we felt really good. We felt really strong. We felt really confident. We were able to recall all of this information so we could do really well. And then the person would be able to go and take a test and be able to succeed and do well and not feel nervous and upset. So it's just a matter of the things that happen in all of our lives. For whatever reason, we have certain associations linked up to them. And you're just able to rewire a person's mind, make those old disconnections or those old connections become disconnected, and then just make new empowering connections of confidence, of courage, of feeling capable and and strong. And that's how you can eliminate a situation of anxiety with somebody through hypnosis. Recently, I interviewed an author from Canada and I asked him, uh, what is one electronic gadget that you would like to see or invent. In fact, I asked that question to every guest as part of the rapid fire. And he gave me an answer saying that I want to see a cap which if somebody wears it and they dream, <laughs> whatever the dreams are uh, dreamt by that person that get captured and that has to be played, right? So that brings me to the next question. After going through your YouTube channel, I also found this interesting stuff about uh, being a lucid uh, dreamer, right? So mm-hmm. how How can we be a lucid dreamer? Because many times people wanted to recollect what they dreamt, right? Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I've had some lucid dreaming experiences. Now, I I know people that they can trigger a lucid dreaming state at any at any point. Now, a a lucid dreaming state, if if people don't know, you're you're kind of having a dream where you're in a dream but you're awake and conscious that you are in this dream. And then therefore you're having this very real experience, but yet you're also able to control the experience that that is happening. And the only time lucid dreaming works for me is if 
for whatever reason, I wake up earlier in the morning for some reason, maybe just up on my own, and then I try to fall back asleep. Those seem to be the moments when I have a, a lucid dream. But you know, I've had these lucid dreams where I I'm saying, "Wow, I I am dreaming," and. I'm able to touch things in the dream and I can, I have all of the sensations like it's a very, very real physical um, experience. It was interesting early on because I had some experiences that when it all was said and done, I didn't know. I thought it was real. I didn't know that I was, that I was dreaming. I had a dream that, you know, I was interacting with my wife and having a conversation with my wife and something was going on. And then but my wife wasn't even home. She had gone out to run some early morning errands and then she had come home and I'm like, well, you were here earlier. We had this whole, and she's like, no, I just, I just got back. That's when I realized I was, you know, I was having a, a lucid dream, but it, it's just a really interesting way to interact with what you perceive as physical reality, yet you're doing so in a dream space where you have unlimited potential and possibilities. You know, I literally flying. I remember having this experience where I floated up to the, you know, the ceiling and I was touching the ceiling and I, I and I was laughing because like, oh my gosh, I, I'm actually doing this right now. I knew it was a dream, but it felt, you know, real. And it's just a fascinating experience that, you know, I'd like to learn to be able to develop a bit more for myself. Uh, so John, uh, let us uh, quickly kick off a quick rapid fire round so that our audience sure. will get to know the other side of you. Okay. <laughs> Let me move on to the first question. What was your childhood fantasy, John? My childhood fantasy, I, I was always fascinated with the idea of time travel and alternate realities. Those, those were two things that were fascinated me with the kid. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so, I love hypnosis so much because in that mind, you can allow people to time travel to make things different within their, you know, in their past, in their minds. And then you can also open people up to alternate realities where they could have an experience with a version of themselves that, you know, is more empowered or more successful. The things that this person over here is looking to do, you can take them into an alternate reality where they can see the potential. So interesting, my childhood fantasies kind of evolved into what I do in my adult life. Yeah, that's very rare, like where people get a chance to work on their childhood fantasy. <laughs> Moving to my next one, what is uh, the best piece of advice that you have received so far? The best piece of advice that I received so far, this was when I was in, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to meet with a science fiction writer. His name is Orson Scott Card. He's a, he's a popular science fiction writer. And of course, at the time I wanted, you know, I was doing screenwriting. And he said to me, when you, he said, here's what's going to happen because you're, you're going to graduate from college and not necessarily going to go be working in the industry right away. And of course I didn't, I had to have some other jobs along the way, but he said, you're either going to cheat your boss or you're going to cheat your writing. And it's up to you to determine who you want to cheat. Meaning that I can give all of my energy and my time and my dedication to this other job over here, or I can give my energy and my time and my attention to what I want to do creatively. So that was something that I always, you know, when I had regular jobs, you know, if I had to call in sick one day to, because there was something creative I was working on, I make sure I, I never cheated what I wanted to do artistically or creatively. That's great. Moving on to my next one. Do you believe in past life and reincarnation? Yes, I do. And now it's an, it's an interesting thing because I've had an experience of hypnosis where I did past life regression. And it was something that there was part of me that when all was said and done, I said, okay, was, was I recalling something that was real? Was I recalling something that my mind you know, was creating? Um, and I wasn't able to have a definitive answer about that, but yet I had this knowledge of past life experiences. And of course, there are, um, you know, many people out there that have had these experiences. Now, is that experience something that physically happened with this individual? Or are they tapping into some uh, greater source energy where all this information is, is, is stored? Um, I don't know, but I, 
definitely believe that it's there's something there to that. Can you share one life changing incident that changed your perspective altogether? Yeah, I, yeah. The, the, this was an early life changing experience. I was about twelve or thirteen years old. And my father was a very talented musician. He liked to play old big band music, Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey. And that was, that was his, his thing. And he had his own orchestra to do that. But my father only believed that that could be his hobby. You know, he had to have a regular job. And my father's mentality was, is that a real man goes out and works 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And then when he's done with that, then on the weekends, he can do what he's interested in. He can pursue his hobbies. Um, My father never believed that he could ever make a living as a full-time musician. So when I was 12 or 13, I said to my my, my dad, I could, what do you think about me going into the entertainment industry, dad, maybe going to film school and and doing this? And my, my father said, I think it's another one of your stupid childish ideas. And so my father was basically telling me that I couldn't do something that I wanted to do. And that stuck up, in, that, that created a, a subconscious, I mean, it was a conscious, but yet a subconscious connection too. It created a lot of pain in my subconscious mind, hearing my father tell me that I couldn't do something, and then seeing how unhappy my father was that he wasn't able to pursue his career in the entertainment industry. And that, I said, man, I'm going to go out, I'm not going to be like my dad, and I'm going to prove my dad wrong. And that was something that propelled me through, uh, you know, through my entire life. So yeah, that was definitely a, a life changing, you know, experience for me. Um, and you know, somebody can say, Oh man, that's too bad. Your dad didn't believe in you. Well, but my dad saying that was actually a tool for me to be able to succeed. And then of course, later on in life, before my father passed away, he was proud of what I was doing. Uh, you know, we, we were able to come to terms, uh, together, but that was definitely a life changing event for me inspirational and i was able to ask like whether your father was proud of you and you mentioned that yeah <laughs> all right moving to the last one for the rapid fire what is one electronic gadget that you like to see or invent gadget or technology anything you know i i think it i there's i don't know if you're familiar with the tv show shark tank uh yeah, they they I, have yeah I, yeah I always thought it would be cool if there was like glasses that you could put on and you see like a little red dot in the glasses and then it 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 beams information into your mind like you could within an instant you could learn another language within an instant you could read a book you could just beam information into your mind i i think that would be uh interesting that may kind of put me out of a job but um i think that would be an interesting thing to have (laughs) indeed it is very interesting all right so that was a great rapid fire and with that let's flip back to the mainstream and before i let you go one final question for today's conversation john what will be your one piece of advice to those aspiring to make big in their careers or lives? You can pick anything. It would go back to just saying, believe in yourself. You know, if, if you want something, if you prefer something, just know that you have everything within you to be able to achieve that. No matter what happens around you, no matter what anybody else says, you can feed your mind. You can uh, feed your spirit. Uh, with, there's a lot of things out there individuals can do like meditation and hypnosis. As long as somebody believes in themselves, they can make something happen. Excellent. And it's simple. That's, that's the biggest piece. There, there's no mystery to that. I don't think that there's any, you know, I don't need to expound on that. If you believe in yourself, um, you could do it. And if you have doubts about yourself, well, then there's things that you can do to improve that. But ultimately at the end of the day, if you're doing something that makes you happy, because I know a lot of people who wanted uh, a certain job or a certain experience, and then they've got there, and it wasn't what they thought it would be, and it doesn't sustain them in happiness. So that's the, that's the thing. Do something that you're passionate about, that you love, that you know you'll dedicate all your time to because it just sustains you in feeling good and happiness. All right. Fabulous. So, John, thank you so much for joining me today, and thank you for all the insights that you shared around hypnosis. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. (laughs) Thank you. And the pleasure is mine hosting you. So, folks, uh, before we move into the trivia section, here is a small request to you. In case if you haven't subscribed to us, please subscribe from the app where you have tuned in from. Also, request you to provide a rating on the platform where you have tuned in from. For example, if you have logged in from um, 
Apple Podcasts request you to kindly leave a review over there. All right. And uh, in addition to that, if you have loved this conversation and found it useful, please share with at least three of your friends or colleagues who can benefit from the guiding voice. Thank you so much in advance. Now, let's continue or let's jump into the previous segment of today's episode. And uh, I would like to continue a few uh, insights about hip- hypnosis other than what John has mentioned. Of course, John is a seasoned uh, hypnotist. And I have done some research and presenting you a few more facts. Like uh, hypnosis has been recognized since the 18th century. And uh, Franz Mesmer is credited with bringing hypnosis to the attention of the public sometime around 1770. I think this was resonated in our conversation with John as well. And uh, hypnosis feels different to different people. Like people who have undergone hypnosis report different feelings while under that particular experience. Some of them describe that experience like falling asleep with the TV on while others might report feeling heavy. And others also use uh, words like light or floating. And because we all internalize experiences differently and it makes sense that the feeling of hypnosis is different for each person. But uh, in case if you feel like getting hypnotized, you may want to consult an expert like John and you will find the details of uh, John's website as well as his coordinates in the show notes. Go ahead and consult with John. All right. So that's all for today. And uh, folks, before I let you go, in case if you have any topic recommendations or speaker suggestions, please drop me a note on social media platforms or email me at theguidingvoiceforyou at gmail.com. Thank you so much in advance. I'm your host, Navin Samala, just a fellow IT professional and a passionate learner on a mission to shape the careers and lives of millions across the globe. Until next time, bye-bye.